This video is going to be on the basic setup and operation of uh, TNT Rescue High Pressure Lifting Bags. Lifting bags have several different uses. The one that we're most familiar with is using them to lift an object off of a patient, uh, typically in a motor vehicle accident where the patient is trapped under the vehicle. Uh, some other uses that they could be used for uh, forcing elevator doors. If we're able to get a purchase with a halogen, uh, we may not be able to get enough force with the halogen to be able to force those doors all the way open. So once we get that purchase, we can slide the, the airbag between the elevator doors and use it to spread them open. Uh, it can also be useful for removing window bars uh, from a building and also for uh, forcing other very high, highly fortified uh, doors where normal means don't, won't generate enough force to, to open them. Uh, to understand the capabilities and limitations of high pressure bags, we have to understand how they operate. Uh, we have bags that range anywhere from 20 tons all the way up to 35 tons. Uh, very seldom are we actually going to get the maximum rate of capacity of that bag. Uh, the reason for that is because the capacity of a lifting bag is directly related to how much surface area of the bag is actually contacting the load that we're trying to lift. So for the sake of easy math, let's say we have a 10 inch by 10 inch airbag. So that provides us with 100 square inches. Each one of those square inches is applying 118 pounds of force to the load because our bags have a maximum air pressure of 118 psi. So each one of those 100 square inches is providing 118 pounds of force against the load. So again, we have a 10 inch by a 10 inch bag gives us 100 square inches times 118 psi gives us approximately 11,800 pounds of force. Right, again, that's taken into account that each one of those square inches of that bag has to be contacting the load. The problem becomes with a high pressure lifting bag, we start out with a very flat surface. So here's our lifting bag, and here's our load. The majority of the bag is contacting the load, but as we inflate it, the bag's going to start to form more of a pillow shape. Now less of the bag is contacting our load. So finally, when we get up to maximum height with our bag, we're typically going to be at 50% or less of the maximum rating capacity. Because each time as we lift, again, starting out, majority of that bag is contacting the load. By the time we get to maximum inflation, we're actually going to have a very small amount of surface area contacting the load. So as we raise higher, a maximum lifting capacity decreases. Right. If we're going to start lifting anything other than our typical motor vehicle, uh, in the normal situation that we deal with, if we're in an urban search and rescue environment, trench collapse, any type of uh, material other than a vehicle where we have a pretty good idea of how much it weighs, we need to be able to estimate the weight of what we're lifting so that we can choose the right bags and know that we're going to have enough capability to lift. So some weights of some common materials. Wood is usually going to weigh about 45 pounds per cubic foot. Now, different species of wood are going to have different densities, different weights. Uh, this is just kind of a rule of thumb to get us close, give us a ballpark figure of what we're dealing with. Another common material in collapses is going to be concrete. Again, different densities, different types of concrete are going to have different weights. Uh, rule of thumb for this though is going to be about 150 pounds per cubic foot. Another one that we should be familiar with is dirt or sand. Uh, it's going to be a big one in a trench collapse or think of a front end loader with a bucket full of, of dirt that may have collapsed or be pinned, have somebody pinned. Uh, typically uh, a bucket's going to carry about a cubic yard of dirt, so it's a good idea to know the weight of that dirt. Dirt is typically going to be about 
100 pounds per cubic foot. Again, going back to that front end loader that's carrying a, a cubic yard of dirt, it's going to be about 2,700 pounds in addition to the weight of the bucket itself. All right, and then finally, again, structural collapses. You may be dealing with steel. It's going to weigh about 490 pounds per cubic foot. All right, so let's say that we have a load that is too heavy for the capacity of our lifting bags. Uh, there are ways that we can increase the capacity of that. Mainly it's going to be using multiple airbags in parallel. What that means is, this is our load, and obviously it's too heavy for one bag to lift. By using multiple bags, we increase that surface area between the lifting bag and the object we're trying to raise, increasing those square inches of force that's going to multiply our force that we can apply against that, that load. So using the same size airbag, theoretically, is going to give us twice the lifting capacity. Another common setup that we see is stacking airbags, one on top of the other, in order to gain additional height. All right, that does not increase our lifting capacity because we still have the same contact area between the lifting bag and the load. So what we gain is more height, but we don't gain anything in lifting capacity. All right. Most manufacturers of airbags recommend not stacking more than two airbags at a time. Personally, I recommend not stacking them at all. Uh, anytime you start to stack airbags on top of each other as they inflate and they form that, that pillow shape, they become unstable to the point where you really can't lift more than about half the, the lifting height of that bag, those bags to begin with. So in the end, you really don't end up with much more lifting height. Uh, much safer and more effective way is to just use a single bag, lift as high as you can, trip the object, stabilize it, deflate the bag, and then build your trimming stack under that bag so that you can gain that additional height. So as we're lifting our load, we need to also trim it to stabilize it because we never trust an airbag uh, to stabilize an object. Anytime an object is being supported by an airbag, we consider that unstable. So we have to have a trimming stack in place to support that load and prevent it from falling should anything go wrong with that airbag. If an airbag bursts, slips, or rolls out, we need to be able to catch that load and prevent it from causing any further harm to the patient or to us. So just like with our airbags and knowing the capabilities and limitations of them, we need to know the same thing about our cribbing. Typically on the engines we carry 4x4 four four cribbing, uh, which is typically a southern yellow pine or a Douglas fir, which has a compression strength of about 150 pounds per cubic inch. So what that means is the standard 4x4 four four is actually 3.5 inches times 3.5 inches. All right. And again, it's going by cubic inches, so we're also figuring the height of it, which is going to be three and a half inches. All right, multiply that by 150 pounds, and that gives us about 6,000 pounds of compression strength. All right, so what that means is we're building the cribbing stack. Each contact point of that cribbing stack is going to give us about 6,000 pounds of support. So different types of cribbing stacks that we can build is our standard 2 by 2 stack. Just going to have two pieces of cribbing on the bottom and two pieces of cribbing laid on top of that. All right. Always remember it, always overlap the cribbing so that there's no chance of it sliding off. All right. So knowing that we have 6,000 pounds per contact point each point where the cribbing crosses over is going to support roughly 6,000 pounds. All right, again, that's taking into consideration that the load has to be supported by all four of those contact points in order to get our maximum uh, rate of support here of 24,000 pounds. All right, the load is only contacting Two of those contact points, 
and we're only going to have 12,000 pounds of available support. All right. In that case, if our load exceeds the capacity of that cribbing, there's a couple of different things we can do. We can change this from a 2x2 stack to a 3x3 stack just by adding more cribbing. Now here we have another contact point. It's going to give us a load capacity of 18,000 pounds. All right, the other option is if we have a large load, we may have to build multiple cribbing stacks. Two more contact points. So that gives us another 12,000 pounds of available support. Now, as we're cribbing, we're dealing with an unstable object, so how high we go with our cribbing is going to be very important. Again, we want to try to make sure that that stable cribbing has to catch the object. We don't want any chance of that cribbing stack collapsing. When we're dealing with an unstable object, we never want to go more than one times the height, you never want to go higher than the length of the cribbing. So if we're dealing with two foot long cribbing, we don't want to crib any higher than two feet. Uh, if we have to go higher than that, then we would have to find longer cribbing. All right, so for the basic setup and operation of the bags, obviously we have our bags, our hoses, we also have a high pressure regulator, it's mounted an SCBA cylinder, and it has an adjustable regulator on it. Again, we set it at 118 PSI, and notice on the gauges you have two sets of numbers. You have numbers in black and numbers in red. When we set this, we're setting it at the red numbers. So we want to set that at 118 PSI by turning this valve. Turning it to the right increases the air pressure. Turning it to the left decreases the air pressure. Right, we have a shutoff here on the outlet. If we have to disconnect the hose, the hose will connect from here to the controller. The hose going from the regulator to the controller connects to the middle connection. So again, dual controller, air coming in goes to the middle connection, air going out to the airbags comes from these two outboard connections. You can see that they're all color coded. So, from the regulator to the intake would be the yellow hose. To the left side controller is red, right side controller is blue. Uh, color coding isn't necessary, uh, but it does help avoid confusion. Again, this is a dual controller. It'll control two air airbags at once using a joystick. Then each one also has a pressure gauge on it. Pushing it away from you inflates the bag, pulling it towards you deflates it. So as we connect this hose, the female end is going to go to the airbag. The male end, which has the shutoff and the pressure relief valve, is going to go to the controller. Uh, that quarter turn shutoff valve, if it's in line with the hose, it's open. If we need to shut it down and disconnect, to the closed position or perpendicular to the hose. Hit the deflate button, that'll relieve the pressure from that. If we can actually disconnect that hose, then we can use the controller to operate another airbag if we needed to. Reconnect that. bags at once, again they're color coded and different colored hoses. This makes it easy uh, to call the commands. Whoever's in command is going to be calling the shots and he's going to say up on red. That means I'm going to inflate red until he tells me to stop. If he wants me to deflate the red bag, he's going to tell me down on red. All right, same thing with the blue line. As we're performing a lifting operation, uh, ideally we want to have several people involved. We want to have, or need to have at least somebody placing the cribbing, somebody operating the controller. 
Uh, if that's all that we have, the person operating the trimming is going to be calling the commands and he's going to give the up on red, down on blue, whatever the command may be. Uh, if we have an additional person, we would like to have somebody in command that can stand back, look at the big picture, and communicate between the trimmer and the controller. When we have an extra person, it's always nice to have a safety officer, somebody that can stand back, who's not involved in the actual operation, and watch the load and see if anything shifts or if any unsafe acts are being taken and that can stop that. When we're terminating the incident, after the patient's been removed and we're getting ready to take everything back, uh, we have to be just as safe as we were during the initial operation. A lot of times when people get hurt in these types of, of operations uh, during the termination phase. So just like when we're lifting, as we're lowering the load back down, we want to trip as we go. Again, never allow that load to, to move any substantial distance where it could injure somebody. So we're going to crib as we lower, uh, stabilize the vehicle, be able to, uh, the, the load, and be able to get our bags back out, disconnect everything, make sure that we do a thorough inspection of all our airbags, hoses, looking for any tears, abrasions, anything that could uh, cause potential failure on the next incident.